reigns forevermore. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Abundant Living, thank you for joining us on this very special Sunday morning. But you know, in a sense, every Sunday is special. But I want to talk today about what's on everybody's mind, and that is the resurrection. You've heard me say over the years so many times, I, you know, I, I'm happy anytime anybody thinks about the Lord. And of course, we are thinking about, hopefully, the believers are thinking about the resurrection this morning, on this beautiful Sunday morning. But unfortunately, for most of our culture, it's just one day a year. And that's what I love about the churches of Christ. We try to teach and we follow the example in the New Testament where they worshiped and took communion every Sunday. And in doing that, we celebrated the Lord's death and His burial and His resurrection. And it also celebrates His return. So we do it every Sunday. We do it 52 weeks out of the year instead of one Sunday. I was interested to note last Sunday night, I was going through the channels, finding, trying to find something to watch, and I noticed the Ten Commandments was on. The Ten Commandments, my, I saw that as a child. In fact, I uh, was able to see when it was filmed. It was made in 1954. But it was interesting that as they showed the credits and uh, gave credit to where they had uh, gotten up their information, it said the main one was the Holy Scriptures. That's where they got their information to do the Ten Commandments, of course. And it was a very, very good movie following very closely the Scriptures. And so it's, I want to just, uh, and, and I think we led up to this last week when we talked about if Christ is not raised, if Christ is not raised, we're still yet in our sins, the Bible says. So this morning, I want you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, because we're going to look at my favorite, my favorite example of the New Testament recording of the resurrection. Of course, Matthew records it, Mark writes, John is the best. John, half of the book of John is the last week of the life of Christ. And so if you want a detailed information about the last seven days Jesus was alive on this earth before the resurrection, then you need to read the book of John. But the uh, the book of Luke, Luke is my favorite anyway because he's a Gentile. He was a physician by trade, and yet he was an inspired writer of the New Testament. He wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And so Luke is just... uh, very detailed in some of his wonderful description about what happened on that Sunday morning. Now the time again is Sunday morning. The place is on a dusty road, seven miles between, it was seven miles between Jerusalem and Emmaus. And the characters in this narrative is Jesus and two other men. And he, only one of them's name is given. And so this is a very interesting thing. But before we look at verse by verse, and I want you to look, we'll begin in verse 13 of Luke 24. So find your Bible and let's open it up and look at it verse by verse because it's a fabulous story. 
about the resurrection. Let me begin by asking you, and pardon my voice this morning, I think I've enjoyed the uh, allergies of North Alabama too much, and I can't seem to throw it off, but uh, maybe we can make it through the program without getting into a coughing spell. I surely hope so. But uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> this is, if you were going to announce the most electrifying event in all the world, how would you go about it? Would you contact all the media, uh, the networks and the cables and all of the uh, social media that we have available to us today, which is unbelievable? And you would say, we get ready now, we're going to make the most wonderful announcement in the world, and that's it, that Jesus Christ, by the power of God, has been resurrected from the dead. I told Central last Sunday when I preached there that we don't come together on Sunday to worship a dead Christ on a cross, but we worship every Sunday to, to worship and to express our gratitude for a living, resurrected Lord. A dead Redeemer is not a Redeemer at all. So then, instead of, in, instead of having this big phenomenal day where people came together, Jesus is walking on a road with two men he didn't even know, and, and as we'll notice in our story, they didn't even know him. But this has always been one of my favorites because of the, the kernels of truth that I found in so many of these verses. It says, now the same day, two men... Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were walking, talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, notice that, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. All right, so it's, it's, it's Sunday morning, and these two men are walking, and, and uh, uh, they are discussing ad adamantly what had happened in Jerusalem. And it's kind of like a ping, ping pong pr uh, game. They were just back and forth and back and forth. And the, and the uh, English and the Greek would indicate that they were talking with each other adamantly about it. They were discussing it. One would talk and say, do you know this? And another one would say, well, I don't know, but do you know this? And about that time, Jesus joins their company. But they don't recognize who he really is. What they knew it was a man. They knew it was there because later, well, we'll see the story unfold. But they didn't know who he was. They knew he was obviously another individual walking with these three men on a dusty road on Sunday afternoon. Verse 17. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you're walking along? Isn't that a good, it's, it's a, I, I love the Lord here. He is just uh, uh, crafty in trying to get in the position he wants to get in in order to reveal the truth. They stood still. Can you imagine that? Uh, uh, the Lord says, what are you fellas talking about? Uh, I, you know, what, what's going on? Did I miss something? You know, what's going on? And they stood still. Now, notice in your Bible, it'll say a form of this, and their faces downcast. One translation says, and they were very sad. You know, it's so interesting. Sometimes you can see a person's face, and you can pretty well tell what's going on. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> I don't know of the times that I've been in the hospital and be walking down the hall and at the end of the hall I can see uh, a group of people that are speaking very quietly and very soberly, but you can look on their face and you can tell that it's not good news. Why are you downcast? Well, he goes on. He's going to tell us why. They're going to tell us why they're downcast. And, uh, but the Lord said, what's the matter? What, uh, what's going on? 
They stood still, their faces downcast. <laughs> and I love this. Then one of them, named Cleophas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to, to Jerusalem, and you do not know the things that have happened there in these days? You know, I, I want to inject a little Alabama language here. Have you been under a rock? You know, where have you been? How could you have been in Jerusalem and not know what's going on? That tells you how widespread the crucifixion was. How adamant uh, the chief priest and the Pharisees were determined to put him to death. And that the Roman soldiers had to gather there to make sure that during this uh, crucifixion, during this a time of putting an individual to death, they did not break the Roman law. And you remember the centurion was there. And when the sun refused to shine at noon and the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, the centurion said, truly, this was the Son of God. Wow. And so then the Lord said, uh, tell me what's going on. And they said, uh, are you a visitor that you don't know what's going on? And now uh, look at verse 19. Jesus says, what things? <laughs> oh my. He's uh, baiting them, as it were. He's trying to draw them out. You know, and he did this a number of, because he was a master teacher. He could, he could get to the point where, like when he came to the woman at the well in John 4, and uh, the woman came at noon, which was very, very rare. You get water in the morning and you get water in the afternoon. You don't get it at noon. But noon was when nobody else was there because she's tired of all the ugly remarks. <laughs> and so she gets there and Jesus is sitting there. The apostles have gone into the next town to get food. And uh, <clears throat> the woman comes up and the Lord says, draw me some water. And she said, well, I would, but you don't have anything to draw with. Then he says, well, you, um, you drink this water, you'll be thirsty again, but the water I give you, you'll never thirst. Well, isn't that a powerful statement? <clears throat> and the uh, woman said, oh, you're a preacher, you're a prophet. And he said, well, kind of. She said, good, I've been wanting to know, where, where are we supposed to worship? Uh, in Jerusalem, or here in Mount uh, Gerizim and Mount Ebal, where the two mountains come together in, uh, in Samaria. And uh, Jesus said uh, in John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter the place, but it does matter the object. The object is the Lord. And the way we do it is in the right attitude and with the right message, the truth. You can't just worship the Lord any way you want to. So anyway, this is the way the Lord was so tactful in His teaching. He didn't drive people off. He didn't tell these fellows. He tells them later that they were foolish and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had said. But he was kind of baiting them. What things? In other words, he was saying, tell me about myself. <laughs> this is one of the humorous parts uh, in the New Testament. And so then it, notice the next verse about, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Let's think about that statement a minute. He was a prophet. The word prophet means speak for, speaks for another. He can tell a past event and interpret that event, or he can interpret, or he can predict a future event. There were major prophets in the Bible and minor prophets, and God used these prophets. I'm going to preach at Central, and uh, I think it's in May. I'm going to preach on the prophets and uh, because they had a story to tell. And the story was basically, how do we get God's people back to the Lord? They had left the Lord. They had forsaken the Lord. And uh, they, you remember, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when in Judges uh, chapter 21, he says, and there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. 
So there, there you go. <laughs> uh, just doing our thing. What's, right, what's the matter with today? What's the matter with some of the horrible days in the past week we have spent? It's when people are lovers of themselves. And Paul says in first, Second Timothy chapter 3, and I, I, I keep bringing this up because it's so true, that in the last days, and we're in them, they shall be lovers of themselves. He goes on to mention some of the worst people in the world. But he, he heads the list by the number one, prof, number one problem. I'm only going to do what I want to do. And I don't care who it hurts. They shall be lovers of themselves. And so then he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed. Notice that's always the order that the Bible gives. He was powerful in word. He preached. He preached the truth. Read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the most powerful sermon I'm sure ever preached because it touches, listen to me this morning, please, it touches every aspect of life. There's not a thing in this world that I go through that isn't mentioned in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And so he was powerful in word. That is, he preached the word. And he then, for three and a half years, he cultivated the, the life and the heart of these 12 apostles. And then he told them to go out and preach the word. Paul tells us to preach the word in Timothy when he says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Let people know who the Lord is. And so he was powerful in deed, in word and in deed. You know, I've been thinking about that deed. <clears throat> Sometimes it's easier, it's easy to forget a word, the word and, you know, I could ask Central, or I could ask Mayfair, or Madison when I preached there, or Woods Crossroads when I preached there. Uh, what did I preach on uh, January the 15th? I don't know. You know, they say if you don't write it down, you, you forget 95% of it. <laughs> well, what did I preach January the 15th? I don't know. Uh, what do you remember? I remember when my mother was dying, you came to the hospital. Oh. I remember when my baby was sick and we were afraid we were going to lose her, you came by and had a prayer. Oh, you remember that, yeah. See, we remember deeds. It's easy to forget words. In uh, fact, when Luke later is introducing the Lord after the resurrection in Acts, the first chapter, he said, uh, the former treatise I wrote under the O Theophilus of all the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach. There he gave the real powerful order, I think. You do first and then you teach. Because in doing, you gain the respect and the credibility of the people you're trying to teach. And so let's start doing uh, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 about everybody that's going to heaven. He said, not everybody's going. Really? Well, what, what, Lord? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. You can just, yes, he's Lord. There are people this morning that obviously may be watching the program, that you believe that the tomb was empty, that he did, he was raised from the dead on that Sunday morning. But he's not the Lord of your life. He's not the Savior of your soul. You haven't decided to do like they did in the book of Acts when uh, preacher uh, Philip stopped the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. And he says, do you understand? He was reading his Bible. And you know, somebody might say, well, that, that's okay. Just read the Bible. No, you got to do what the Bible says. <laughs> And so he said, uh, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I except someone should guide me? And he took from this very passage and preached unto him Jesus. That is one of my favorite scriptures. 
And so then he was powerful indeed and before God. In other words, he was God's man. He was God's spokesman. Jesus said, uh, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him and all the people. But notice this, the Pharisees, <clears throat> but the chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. There were a number of ways of beating, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of putting people to death. But the most e excruciating, the, the very, e the most inhumane way of doing it was a crucifixion. And you remember how that took place. And the Bible doesn't play upon our emotions. The Bible says it in just about 13 verses in one of the accounts about the crucifixion. It doesn't go on and on and on. Why? Because man didn't read the Bible, didn't, re didn't write the Bible. The Lord did. And they crucified him. Don't run over that lightly. He was mocked, he was spat upon. He was flogged. That is, he's beating, he was beaten with rods, or he was beaten with whips, uh, with uh, uh, strips of leather, with pieces of bone tied on the end of the, of the leather. So when you were hit with it, it would probably draw blood the first time. The second and the third and the fourth time, it would crack the ribs. So let's don't run across that word flippantly. And they crucified him. Now then, this is interesting because they go on, verse 21 says, but we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped he was the one, but evidently not. They put him on a cross and uh, he's dead. That's the end of that. No, it's not. The first of all, <clears throat> well, let's, go, let's let the Lord answer it. And moreover, it is the third day since all this took place. This is what these men are saying. We're, we've had it. We've lost all hope. We had hoped that he'd come to redeem Israel. Well, he had, but not in the sense. They were talking about in a political sense. They were talking about in an emotional sense that he would come and redeem Israel. He did redeem Israel spiritually by making his death available to them to have their sins forgiven as well as others. In addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. Well, isn't that interesting? Who stole the body away? That's what uh, Frank Morrison wrote in his book on who moved the stone. He was an atheist in the beginning in that he did not believe that Christ was raised from the dead. He thought that was a hoax. But he set out to try to find the truth. Being an attorney, he pulled in all the information he could find and he became a very, very strong believer. Yeah, I have that book in my library. It's a wonderful book. Who rolled the stone away? Who moved the stone? Well, uh, the Jews did. Well, why didn't they produce it? Well, the apostles did. Why would they do that? They've been preaching he was going to be resurrected. We noticed last Sunday that if Christ is not raised, the apostles are liars. And the Lord is a liar because he said, destroy this temple and in three days it will be raised again. And so then <clears throat> he said to the women, but they didn't find the body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who, uh, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found that it was just as the women had said, but him they did not see. That was Peter and John. You know, they had a foot race to the, to the tomb. And when they got in there, it was empty. Where did he go? Who stole the body away? Then Jesus said, I can't let this go. I've got to say this to you, you fellas. Oh, foolish how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets had spoken. All the prophets had predicted this. Did not this Christ need to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? 
And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the Scriptures concerning himself. He finally got to the point, didn't he? You see how tactful Jesus was in dealing with these men? that they had come and they had talked about this and their hope had been dashed and they had, they said, we don't know what we're going to do. We had hoped that he had come and deliver us from, from Rome, but he didn't. But yet we don't know where the body is. He said, oh, foolish men, your heart is slow. It's not, it's not in tune with what the prophets had said. Just read your Bible is basically what he said. The prophets predicted that Christ would be raised on the third day. I love this last statement, and all of the scriptures concerning himself. I've told you before, if you read the Bible and you don't see Jesus, you misread it. You need to go back. He didn't begin in Bethlehem, and he wasn't finished in Jerusalem, because after the resurrection, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared unto 500 people at one time and to the apostles. Now then, I've got to hurry and finish the story. And as they approached the village, they were going, as, and Jesus acted as if he would go further. And they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is near evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in and stayed. And when he went in, they sat down to have a meal. Read it in verse 30. He was at the table. He took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them. Now, here's the whole point of the whole story. Verse 31, then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Let me read on. They ask each other, were not our hearts, this is so beautiful to me, was not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and open the scriptures to us. Didn't our hearts burn? Do you know, can you think of a better expression? Our hearts burn within us. In other words, these men were, made, were obviously turned around in their lives and they returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 and they said, this is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the, two, then the two told what had happened on their way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. When he broke the bread, you see, I think he handed them the bread and they saw the nail prints in his hands. This is my favorite story. Thank you for letting me share it with you on this special Sunday morning. May God bless you. Here's my prayer. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ. A place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord.